Chapter 9 of The Impossibles The Impossibles by Lawrence M. Jennifer and Randall Garrett Chapter 9 The afternoon was bright and sunny, but it didn't match Malone's mood. He got a cab outside the precinct station and headed for 69th Street, dining off his nails en route. When he hit the FBI headquarters, he called Washington and got Burris on the line. He made a full report to the FBI chief, including his wild theory and everything else that had happened. And there was this notebook, he said, and reached into his jacket pocket for it. The pocket was empty. One notebook, Burris said. Malone tried to remember if he left the book in his room. He couldn't quite recall. This book I picked up, he said, and described it. I'll send it on or bring it in when the case is over. All right, Burris said. Malone went on with his description of what had happened. When he finished, Burris heaved a great sigh. My goodness, he said. Last year it was telepathic spies, and this year it's teleporting thieves. Malone, I hate to think about next year. I wish you hadn't said that, Malone said sadly. Burris blinked. Why, he said. Oh, just because, Malone said. I haven't even had time to think about next year yet, but I'll think about it now. Well, maybe it won't be so bad, Burris said. Malone shook his head. No, Chief, he said. You're wrong. It'll be worse. This is bad enough, Burris said. It's a great vacation, Malone said. Please, Burris said. Did I have any idea? Yes, Malone said. Burris's eyes closed. All right, Malone, he said after a little pause. Let's get back to the report. At least it explains the red Cadillac business. Sergeant Dukovsky was hit by a boy who vanished. Vanished? My God. I was hit by a boy who vanished too, Malone said bitterly. But of course, I'm just an FBI agent, expendable. Nobody cares about... Don't say that, Malone, Burris said. You're one of my most valuable agents. Malone tried to stop himself from beaming, but he couldn't. Well, Chief, he began, I... Vanishing boys, Burris muttered. What are you going to do with them, Malone? I was hoping you might have some kind of a suggestion, Malone said. Me? Well... Malone said, I suppose I'll figure it out when I catch them. But I did want something from you, Chief. Anything, Malone, Burris said. Anything at all. I want you to get hold of Dr. O'Connor out at Yucca Flats, if you can. He's the best psionics man Westinghouse has right now, and I might need him. If you say so, Burris said doubtfully. Well, Malone said, these kids are teleports. And maybe there's some way to stop a teleport. Give him a good hard kick in the sigh, for instance. In the what? Never mind, Malone said savagely. But if I'm going to get any information on what makes teleports tick, I'm going to have to get it from Dr. O'Connor, right? Right, Burris said. So get in touch with Dr. O'Connor, Malone said. I'll have him call you, Burris said. Meanwhile, well, meanwhile, just carry on, Malone. I've got every confidence in you. Thanks, Malone growled. If anyone can crack a case like this, Burris said, it's you. I suppose it had better be, Malone said, and rang off. Then he started to think. The notebook wasn't in his pockets. He checked every one, even the jacket pocket where he usually kept a handkerchief and nothing else. It wasn't anywhere on his person. Had he left it in his room? He thought about that for several minutes and finally decided that he hadn't. He hadn't taken it out of his pocket, for one thing, and if it had fallen to the ground, he couldn't have helped seeing it. Of course, he put his wallets, keys, change, and other such items on the dresser and then replaced them in his pockets in the morning, but he could remember how they looked on the dresser. The notebook hadn't been there among them. Now that he had come to think of it, 
when had he seen the notebook last? He'd shown it to Lieutenant Lynch during the afternoon, and then he put it back in his pocket, and he hadn't looked for it again. So it had to be somewhere in one of the bars he'd visited, or at the theater where he and Dorothy had seen the hot seat. Proud of himself for this careful and complete job of deduction, he strolled out and, giving Boyd and the agent in charge one small smile each to remember him by, he went into the sunlight, trying to decide which place to check first. He settled on the theater because it was most probable. After all, people were always losing things in theaters. Besides, if he started at the theater and found the notebook there, he could then go on to a bar to celebrate. If he found the notebook in a bar, he didn't much relish the idea of going on to an empty theater in the middle of the afternoon to celebrate. Shaking his head over this flimsy structure of logic, he headed down to the hot seat. He banged on the lobby doors for a while without any good result, and finally leaned against one of the side doors which opened. Malone fell through, recovered his balance, and found himself facing an old bewhiskered man with a dustpan, a broom, and a surprised expression. I'm looking for a notebook, Malone said. Try a stationary story, youngster, the old man said. I thought I'd heard them all, but... No, Malone said. You don't understand. I don't gotta understand, the old man said. That's what's so restful about this here job. I just gotta sweep up. I don't gotta understand nothing. Goodbye. I'm looking for a notebook I lost here last night, Malone said desperately. Oh, the old man said. Lost and found. That's different. You come with me. The old man led Malone in silence to a cave deep in the bowels of the theater, where he went behind a little desk, took up a pencil as if it were a club, held it poised over a sheet of grimy paper, and said, Name? Malone said, I just want to find a notebook. Gotta give me your name, youngster, the old man said solemnly. It's the rules here. Malone sighed. Kenneth Malone, he said, and my address is, the old man, fiercely scribbling, looked up. Wait a minute, can't you? He said. I ain't through Kenneth yet. He wrote on and finally said, Address? Hotel New Yorker, Malone said. In Manhattan? The old man said. That's right, Malone said wearily. Ah, the old man said. Tourist, ain't ya? Tourists is always losing things. Once it was a big dog. Don't know yet how a dog got into this here theater. Had to feed it for four days before somebody showed up to claim it. Fierce-looking animal. Part bloodhound, part water spaniel. Fascinated in spite of himself, Malone said, That's impossible. Nothing's impossible, the old man said. Work for a theater long enough, and you'll find that out. Part bloodhound, I said, and part water spaniel. Should have seen that dog before you start talking about impossibilities. Hell of a strange-looking beast. And then there was the time. About the notebook, Malone said. Notebook, the old man said. I lost a notebook, Malone said. I was hoping that... Description? The old man sat and poised his pencil again. Malone heaved a great sigh. Black plastic, he said, about so big. He made motions with his hands. No names or initials on it, but the first page had my name written on it, along with Lieutenant Peter Lynch. Who's he? The old man said. He's a cop, Malone said. My, my, the old man said. Valuable notebook with a cop's name in it and all. You a cop, youngster? Malone shook his head. Too bad, the old man said obscurely. I like cops. He stood up. You said black plastic? Black? That's right, Malone said. Do you have it here? Got no notebooks at all here, youngster, the old man said. Empty billfold, three hats, a couple of coats, and some pencils, and an umbrella. No dogs tonight, youngster, and no notebooks. Oh, Malone said. Well, wait a minute. What is it, youngster? The old man said. 
I'm busy this time of day. Got to sweep and clean. Got work to do. Not like you tourists. With difficulty, Malone leashed his temper. Why did I have to describe the notebook, he said. You haven't got any notebooks at all. That's right, the old man said cheerfully. But you made me describe. That's the rules, the old man said. And I ain't about to go against the rules, not for no tourist. He put the pencil down and rose. Wish you were a cop, he said. I never met a cop. They don't lose things like people do. Making a mental note to call up later and talk to the manager, if the notebook hadn't turned up in the meantime, Malone went off to find the bars he had stopped in before the theater. Saving tops for last, he started at the ad lib, where a surprised, bald-headed man told him they hadn't found a notebook anywhere in the bar for something like six weeks. Now, if you'd been looking for umbrellas, he said, we could have accommodated you. Got over ten umbrellas downstairs waiting for their owners. I wonder why people lose so many umbrellas. Maybe they hate rain, Malone said. I don't know, the bald man said. I'm sort of a psychologist, you know, a judge of people. I think it's an unconscious protest against the fetters of a society which is slowly strangling them by... Malone said goodbye in a hurry and left. His next stop was the Zochil, the Mexican bar on 46th Street. He greeted the bartender warmly. Ah, the bartender told him. You come back. We look for you. Look for me, Malone said. You mean you found my notebook? Notebook, the bartender said. A little black plastic book, Malone said, making motions, about so big, and it... Not find, the bartender said. You lose him? Sure, I lost him, Malone said. I mean, it. Would I be looking for it if I hadn't lost it? Who knows, the bartender said and shrugged. But you said you were looking for me, Malone said. What about? Oh, the bartender said. I only say that. Make customer feel good. Think we miss him. Customers like... So we do. What your name? Pizarro, Malone said disgustedly and went away. The last stop was Tops. Well, he had to find the notebook there. It was the only place the notebook could be. That was logic, and Malone was proud of it. He walked into Tops, trying to remember the bartender's name, and found it just as he walked into the bar. Hello, Wally, he said gaily. The bartender stared at him. I'm not Wally, he said. Wally's the night barman. My name's Ray. Oh, Malone said, feeling deflated. Well, I've come about a notebook. Yes, sir, Ray said. I lost the notebook here yesterday evening between six and eight. If you'll just take me to the lost and found. One moment, sir, Ray said, and left him standing at the bar all alone. In a few seconds, he was back. I didn't see the notebook myself, sir, he said. But if Wally picked it up, he'd have turned it over to the maitre d'. Perhaps you'd like to check with him. Sure, Malone said. The daytime maitre d' turned out to be a shortish, heavy-set man with large blue eyes, a silver mane, and a thin pencil-lined mustache. He was addressed for no reason that Malone was able to discover as B.B. Ray introduced them. This gentleman wants to know about a notebook, he told B.B. Notebook, B.B. said. Malone explained at length. B.B. nodded in an understanding fashion for some moments and, when Malone had finished, disappeared in search of the lost and found. He came back rather quickly with the disturbing news that no notebook was anywhere in the place. It's got to be here, Malone said. Well, B.B. said, it isn't. Maybe you left it someplace else. Maybe it's home now. It isn't, Malone said, and I've tried every place else. New York's a big city, Mr. Malone, B.B. said. Malone sighed. I've tried every place I've been. The notebook couldn't be somewhere I haven't been. A rolling stone follows its owner. He thought about that. It didn't seem to mean anything, but maybe it had. There was no way to tell for sure. He went back to the bar to think things over and figure out his next move. 
A bourbon and soda while thinking seemed the obvious order, and Ray bustled off to get it. Had he left the notebook on the street somewhere, just dropping it by accident? Malone couldn't quite see that happening. It was, of course, possible but the possibility was so remote that he decided to try and think of everything else first. There was Dorothy, for instance. Had he gotten stewed enough that he had shown Dorothy the notebook? He didn't remember doing it, and he didn't quite see why he would have. Most of the evening was more or less clear in his mind. He hadn't apparently forgotten any other details either. All the same, it was an idea. He decided to give the girl a call and find out for sure. Maybe she remembered something that would help him anyway. He took the drink from Ray and slid off the bar stool. Two steps away, he remembered one more little fact. He didn't have her number, and he didn't know anything about where she lived except that it could be reached by subway. That, Malone told himself morosely, limited things nicely to the five boroughs of New York. And she said she was living with her aunt. Would she have a phone listing under her own name? Or would the listing be under her aunt's name, which he also didn't know? At any rate, he could check listings under Dorothy Francis, he told himself. He did so. There were lots and lots of people named Dorothy Francis in Manhattan and in all the other boroughs. Malone went back to the bar to think some more. He was on his second bourbon and soda, still thinking but without any new ideas, when B.B. tapped him gently on the shoulder. Pardon me, the major d' said, but are you English? Am I what? Malone said, spilling a little of his drink on the bar. Are you English? B.B. said. Oh, Malone said, no, Irish, very Irish. That's nice. B.B. said. Malone stared at him. I think it's fine, he said, but I'd love to know why you asked me. Well, B.B. said, I knew you couldn't be American, not after the phone call. You don't have to hide your nationality here. We're quite accustomed to foreign visitors, and we don't have special prices for tourists. Malone waited two breaths. Will you please tell me, he said slowly, what it is you're talking about. Certainly, B.B. said with a plum. There's a call for you in the upstairs booth. A long-distance call. Personal. Oh, Malone said. Who'd know I was... He stopped, thinking hard. There was no way for anybody in the world to know that he was in tops. Therefore, nobody could be calling him. They've got the wrong name, he said decisively. Oh, no. B.B. said, I heard them quite distinctly. You are Sir Kenneth Malone, aren't you? Malone gaped for one long second, and then his mind caught up with the facts. Oh, he said, sure. He raced upstairs to the phone booth, said, This is Sir Kenneth Malone, into the blank screen, and waited. After a while, an operator said, Person-to-person -person call, Sir Kenneth, from Yucca Flats. Will you take this call? I'll take it. Malone said. A face appeared on the screen, and Malone knew he was right. He knew exactly how he'd been located, and by whom. Looking only at the face in the screen, it might have been thought that the woman who appeared there was somebody's grandmother, kindly, red-cheeked, and twinkle-eyed. Perhaps that wasn't the only stereotype. She could have been an old maid school teacher, one of the kindly school teachers who taught once upon a time that never was in the little red schoolhouses of the dim past. The face positively radiated kindliness and friendship and peace. But if the face was the face of a sentimental dream, the garb was the garb of royalty. Somebody's grandmother was on her way to a costume party. She wore the full court costume of the days of Queen Elizabeth I, complete with brocaded velvet gown, wide, rough collar, and bejeweled skull cap. She was, Malone knew, completely insane. 
Like all the other telepaths, Malone and the rest of the FBI had found during their work in uncovering a telepathic spy. She had been located in an insane asylum. Months of extensive psychotherapy, including all the newest techniques, and some so old that psychiatrists were a little afraid to use them, had done absolutely nothing to shake the firm conviction in the mind of Miss Rose Thompson. She was, she insisted, Elizabeth Tudor, rightful Queen of England. She claimed she was immortal, which was not true. She also claimed to be a telepath. This was perfectly accurate. It had been her help that had enabled Malone to find the telepathic spy, and a grateful government had rewarded her. It had given her a special expense allotment for life, covering the clothing she wore and the style in which she lived. Rooms had been set aside for her at Yucca Flats, and she held court there, sometimes being treated by psychiatrists and sometimes helping Dr. Thomas O'Connor in his experiments and in the development of new psionic machines. She was probably the happiest psychopath on earth. Malone stared at her. For a second, he could think of nothing to say, but, my God, he said it. Not at all, Sir Kenneth, the little old lady said. You're a queen. Malone took a deep breath. Good afternoon, your majesty, he said. Good afternoon, Sir Kenneth, she said, and waited. After a second, Malone figured out what she was waiting for. He inclined his head as in courtly a bow as he could manage over a visiphone. I am deeply honored, he said, that your majesty has called on me. Is there any way in which I might be of service? Oh, goodness me, no, said the little old lady. I don't need a thing. They do one very well here in Yucca Flats. You must come out soon and see my new throne room. I've had the decorations done by... Oh, but I can see you're not interested in that, Sir Kenneth. But Malone realized it was useless to argue with the old lady. She was telepathic and knew exactly what he was thinking. That, after all, was how he had been located. She had mentally hunted for him until she found him. But why? I'll tell you why, Sir Kenneth, the little old lady said. I'm worried about you. Worried? About me, Your Majesty? Certainly the little old lady said, inclining her head just the proper number of degrees and raising it again. You, Sir Kenneth, and that silly little notebook you lost. You've been stewing about it for the last hour. It was obvious that, for reasons of her own, the queen had seen fit to look into Malone's mind. She found him worrying and called him about it. It was, Malone thought, sweet of her in a way, but it was also just a bit disconcerting. He was perfectly well aware that the queen could read his mind at any distance. But unless something reminded him of the fact, he didn't have to think about it. And he didn't like to think about it. Don't be disturbed, the queen said. Please, I only want to help you, Sir Kenneth. You know that. Well, of course I do, Malone said, but heavens to Betsy, she said. Sir Kenneth, what kind of a detective are you? What? Malone said and added at once, Your Majesty. He knew perfectly well, of course, that Miss Thompson was not Queen Elizabeth I, and he knew that Miss Thompson knew what he thought. But she didn't mind. Politeness, she held, was the act of being pleasant on the surface, no matter what a person really thought. People were polite to their bosses, she pointed out, even though they were perfectly sure that they could do a better job than the bosses were doing so she insisted on the surface pretense that Malone was going through, treating her like a queen. The psychiatrist had called her delusion a beautifully rationalized one. As far as Malone was concerned, it made more sense than most of real life. That's very nice of you, Sir Kenneth, the queen said. But I ask you again, what kind of detective are you? Haven't you got any common sense at all? Malone hated to admit it, but he had always had just that suspicion. After all, he wasn't a very good detective. He was just lucky. His luck had enabled him to break a lot of tough cases. 
but someday people would find out, and then... Well, the queen said, at the very least you ought to act like a detective. She sniffed audibly. Sir Kenneth, I'm ashamed that a member of my own FBI can't do any better than you're doing now. Malone blinked into the screen. He did feel ashamed in a vague sort of way, and he was willing to admit it. But he did feel, wistfully, that it would be nice to know just what he was being ashamed of. Have I been missing something? he said. Outside of the obvious, the queen said, that you've been missing your notebook, or rather, Mike Fueo's notebook. Yes, you certainly have, the queen said. Don't you see what happened to that notebook? You've been missing the only possible explanation. But there isn't any, Malone said, unless Miss Francis has it. Her Majesty gave him a bright smile. There, she said. There what, Malone said. I knew you could do it, the Queen said. All you had to do was apply your intelligence and you'd come up with just the fact you needed. What fact, Malone said. That Miss Francis has your notebook, Queen said. You just told me. All right, Malone said and stopped and took a deep breath. My God, he said after a pause. What is that supposed to mean? Did I give it to her after all? No, the Queen said. Did I lose it and did she pick it up? No, the Queen said. My God. Malone said again. All right, I give up. Is this 20 questions? Sir Kenneth, the queen said. What a way to talk to your queen. Malone took another breath. I'm sorry, he muttered, but... Yes, I know, the queen said sympathetically. You're upset. But you didn't give Miss Francis the notebook, and she didn't find it after you lost it. Then, Malone stared. She stole it. She stole it from me. I imagine she took it right from your jacket pocket, the queen said. Now, if you'd only wear proper clothing and a proper pouch at your belt, I'd be stared at, Malone said, in court clothing. No one in New York would stare at you, the queen said. They'd think it was what they call an advertising stunt. Anyhow, Malone said, I wasn't wearing court clothing so that made it easy for her to steal the notebook. But why, for God's sakes, why? Because, the queen said, she needed it. Needed it? Malone shrieked. Please, Sir Kenneth, the queen said, don't talk to your sovereign in that manner. And I do wish you'd stop thinking of that girl as Dorothy Francis. She isn't at all, you know. No, Malone said, I don't know. If she isn't Dorothy Francis, who in hell is she? Don't swear, Sir Kenneth, the queen said. She's Dorothea Francisca Fueo, if you want to know. Malone gulped. Then she's... That's right, the queen said. She's little Miguel Fueo's older sister. End of chapter nine. Read by Paul Hampton.